Um, all right, folks. Hi, um, my name is Sarah Weekly from Policy Scotland at the University of Glasgow, and we are delighted that you're here today for um, another, I believe this is the fourth um, seminar in our series with the Third Sector Research Forum. Today, we're going to be talking about demystifying research ethics for third sector organizations, and this came out of um, a discussion at the Third Sector Research Forum about their new guide to applying research ethics principles for third sector organizations, um, which is a new guide that has come out, it came out in June from the forum. And if you haven't had um, a look at that, the first um, person who's gonna talk to us is gonna be Jane, who's gonna run through that for us. And um, don't worry, there's also a link to that guide in these slides as well. Um, just to let folks know, again, you already know, this is being recorded in, probably within the next week, we'll also be able to put up the slides and I'll be writing a quick blog about um, this event as well. So this is a quick rundown of what we're gonna be up to today. Um, hello, I'm, I'm me. I'm going to be um, introducing what we're happy, what's happening today. Then we're going to have um, Jane speak about the ethics guide. Then we're going to um, have um, Laura Robertson and Fiona McCarty talk from the Poverty Alliance about um, implementing some of the principles into their own research. After that, we're going to have Amy Calder and Neil Davidson speak about developing a re research ethics policy. Um, and then we're going to have an opportunity for um, you all to present some of your questions to the speakers. Um, there are two ways that you can uh, put questions to the speakers. You can use the chat function on Zoom. You can also um, use the um, raise hand function as well. And that raise hand function should be near the bottom of your screen um, in the reactions button. So if you click on that button, there's, it should have a little pop-up that says raise hand. So if you're, you'd be more comfortable raising your hand, um, you'll pop up on my screen and I'll, I'll call on you. But that's just a short period um, for that. If you, if you um, do have clarification questions for folks, you can put those into the chat and then I will send any of those questions on to the speakers as well um, so that they can get back to you if there are questions about clarification. We're going to have, um, and then we're going to have a, a breakout discussion. Um, again, this is a relatively open discussion about um, research ethics principles, how you you approach re research ethics in your own work. There's not going to be any formal reporting out or anything of that nature. Um, it's just going to be a relatively open discussion about that, and hopefully we can um, learn from all the other folks in our groups. So, and then I'll just bring back and wrap up for folks. So um, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to uh, kick it over to Jane Marriott from Evaluation Support Scotland. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to introduce um, the guide that the Third Sector Research Forum um, has recently published, um, as Sarah said. Right, so next slide, please. First of all, I'm going to explore what um, ethical research principles mean and why we should consider them. So when I googled the definition of ethics, I found this first uh, definition, which is rather wordy. And then uh, when I googled the best definition, I found this second one. And both say what ethics is, um, but um, they're rather wordy and perhaps not in plain language plain English. So um, what are we think, what are we talking about? Well, we at the forum think it's um, about making sure we conduct all our research from beginning to end in a way that keeps us and our participants safe. It's about making the best decisions by considering the impact of our research at all times to all concerned. But that isn't as easy in practice as it may sound. And sometimes we have to grapple with ethical dilemmas and at others we can easily fall into pitfalls which perhaps we weren't aware of. So the Third Sector Research Forum decided to write a plain English guide to set out some ethical research principles. 
uh, by which we can make decisions perhaps more easily. Next slide, please. Because we all want to do research well and ensure that as we find out the answers to our questions, we don't upset or harm those that we're working with, those we're interviewing and um, with who are involved in our research or even ourselves. We felt having a set of principles at the heart of making good health ethical research decisions was the best way forward. And in our new guide, we've set out five principles. Next slide, please. The first of these is, is need. Uh, research should only be carried out where there's a clear, um, a clear evidence of need for the research. This means knowing why we're undertaking our research, being able to tell others the practical value and benefit of our research. Um, a good way of thinking about this is asking, is, is this research, are we doing it for just research's sake? And other questions such as, why is this research being proposed? Who will it benefit? What are we hoping will change because of this research? And importantly, is there any evidence existing which will tell us what we want to know? What potential benefits um, exist for the research participants and the community? And what potential harm could be caused uh, to participants? The second principle, integrity is that we should, research should be undertaken in an honest, open and respectful way. This means involving and informing our participants about all aspects of our research at all stages, from collecting data to how findings are published and disseminated. This will involve, to some extent, sharing power and decision making with participants. As an example given in the guide where integrity was not kept was using a research method uh, without the participant's full knowledge. So the researcher had used observation uh, for, uh, for their method, but actually um, they, were in, they were observing in a hidden way um, behind um, a curtain. And so the participants didn't know that they were being observe, observed. So to ensure integrity, we need to consider whether We've informed the participants about research, how it will be conducted, and they have given their consent to do so. The third principle is accountability. This means doing what uh, we say we'll do, um, not making false promises or, um, or increasing people's expectations um, unnecessarily. Choosing safe research methods and being considerate uh, to our participants about what we ask and how, being aware of the impact of our research um, may have is really important. There in the, again, in the guide, there's an example of not um, great uh, decision making when a researcher produces a report which he thinks would make a difference um, for the community. So because it evidenced the negative side um, of the community that he was researching. And researcher thought this would be really good because he thought the participants would be able to go ahead and attract funding for their community. However, the participants were dismayed at the portrayal of their community. To make good decisions regarding accountability, you need to ask about systems you will use to ensure fairness and impartiality. How will how will you judge if the research has been undertaken with rigor and is robust? If you were working with service users who may be sensitive to a subject or a certain question, how would you plan to, to mitigate the potential harm that, that, that may be caused? And are your chosen research methods safe for participants and researchers? The fourth principle uh, is confidentiality. And keeping service users' confidentiality is commonplace in our work in the third sector, but in some ways it can be tricky um, when we're researching some small or specific populations, ensuring that you keep confidentiality, even when reporting your research findings, is really important. Um, for example, if you're researching a small group of people, it may become obvious in your report who you are quoting, even when the quotes are anonymous, uh, but just for what the quote um, says, 
and there's some great examples in the guide for you to see. Obviously, you need to comply with GCPR and make sure you have informed consent about storing research data, etc. To consider these issues, it's helpful to ask questions such as what is your process for obtaining informed consent? And how will you inform participants about what that means um, and what to consider before giving them their consent? And there's a good example on the Third Sex Research Forum website um, of a, a video that was made by a PhD student um, uh, about the informed, giving informed consent, uh, which she played to um, her participants before um, asking them to give consent. And her form is also um, available on the website for you to see. The last uh, principle is safety. Um, and this means ensuring the physical, social, and psychological well being of the participants, um, making sure they're not adversely affected. Um, by the research processes you, you choose. As a researcher, we should be knowledgeable and sensitive to the potential risks to our participants. Um, obviously, we, can, we have to do that in very practical ways. Um, so um, ensuring that we have in, in closed disclosure if we're, talk, if we're uh, researching with young people or vulnerable people. Um, you could ask um, about a risk assessment, has that been complete, completed? And if the researchers are likely to encounter unsafe or risky situations whilst conducting the research, what arrangements have been made to keep them safe? For example, um, also you'll need to um, ensure that there's support for your participants if they need it too. And for example, during the pandemic, when research was conducted online, this um, might have needed sort of different considerations and solutions. For example, how to provide post-research interview support um, if it's needed to someone in their own home. Have to think sort of carefully how you might be able to put that in place. Also think about privacy and online research. Um, a person may be overheard by someone in the household who may take offense of what they said might put, um, it might be distressing for the participant, the research participant, and may have put them in danger. Or it may inhibit the participant saying what they wanted to say to you. So that's a sort of whistle-stop um, tour of our five principles. There's a lot more um, in the guide, so do have a look at that, um, and a lot of examples along the way um, with it. We think following these five examples would give you the confidence that you will be able to justify the decisions you've made in how to conduct your research um, to your organisations, to the research participants, to people reading your findings and to funders. It will demonstrate you've considered how to undertake good research practice and are satisfied that you've done your best to conduct your research ethically. Next slide, please. Um, the guide's got lots of examples and checklists and so forth, and it will be um, useful for third sector practitioners, researchers, academics, commissioners, funders, um, and for, um, for very different uses. So at all stages during your, your project, your research project, but also to develop a research ethics policy. Uh, we'll hear about that later. So when commissioning or funding research, or if you're working in partnership with academics, um, you'd be able to use the guide to check mutual understanding of, eth of ethical terminology and processes and decision making. And as I said, you can download that from the website. And I've put a link in the chat uh, for you um, to do so. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, just what you will see when you go into our third sector research forum and pages. So um, just um, a, as a, a visual uh, clue for you. But we're interested in hearing from those using the guide uh, because we're going to put an accompanying document to this together um, by next February um, of case studies of people using the guide. Um, and we will be presenting these at an event uh, which we will continue and extend our conversations 
about ethical research in the third sector. If you want to know more about the forum, again, there's information on the website. Um, and please get in touch with me um, if you'd like to showcase your use um, of, the, of the guide um, in the future. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jane, for that. Um, and again, I would um, encourage everybody to take a look at that guide, maybe not right now, maybe after this um, seminar is over. Um, but um, what we're going to do now is we're going to hand this over to Fiona McCarty and Laura Robertson from the Poverty Alliance, who are going to speak a little bit about their own research. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm going to start off. My name's Laura. I'm co-presenting with my colleague Fiona today. Um, also, a special shout out to Beth Clofton, who is part of the research team at Poverty Alliance and has been instrumental to ensuring our research is um, based on care and justice during the pandemic. So this afternoon, we'll be sharing examples of how we've applied the principles that are in the Third Sector Research Forum's guide to our own research, and particularly drawing on examples from research that we've been conducting during the pandemic with families living on low incomes. So um, we'll principally have been talking about research we've done as part of the Get Heard Scotland programme. So we conducted um, interviews with 34 families um, between November um, 2020 and March this year in Renfrewshire and Inverclyde as, as part of Get Heard Scotland, um, asking them about their experiences around um, mental health, community support, social security, employment and digital exclusion during the pandemic. And the pandemic presented several um, practical challenges for us as a team as we moved from conducting research face to face to the use of, uh, to the use of Zoom and telephone and um, other alternative methods, um, including digital diaries. Um, it presented new ethical challenges for us um, as we sought to speak to families facing a, a range of pressures during lockdown and at a distance. So to illustrate how uh, we navigated this challenge, um, Fiona and myself will specifically be focusing on the principles of need, integrity and safety outlined in the guide. So next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so just a wee bit about Poverty Alliance before we start. Um, we are Scotland's um, national anti-poor poverty network. We're made up of organisations and community members and an advisory board of people with lived experience of poverty, um, who are the, known as the Community Activist Advisory Group. We have a, a dedicated team of staff um, delivering a range of projects, including Living Wage Scotland and um, Challenge Poverty Week, which is coming up soon. And of course, Get Heard Scotland, which we'll be drawing on today. Um, Get Heard Scotland is funded by the Scottish Government um, it is based on the commitments made in the Scottish Government's Child Poverty Delivery Plan and it involves engaging with members of communities, grassroots organisations as well um, to provide um, evidence informed and experienced um, accounts of living on a low income which are fed back to the Scottish Government. Um, next slide please Sarah. Oh, you might need to click a few times. Um, so yeah, just a bit about the, the changes we want to see as an organisation as well. So all of our work centres around um, four key areas. So firstly, adequate incomes, ensuring everyone has access to an adequate income via our social, social security system, as well as through the real living wage. Um, also promoting access to high quality public services. Um, so that's working with organisations who provide services to increase the understanding of barriers faced by people living in poverty. Um, our work is also focused on increasing public support um, to end poverty, including the discrimination that people on low incomes face, as well as ensuring opportunities to participate, um, which is at the heart of anything that we do. So um, I'm going to pass on to Fiona. Um, who's going to um, start talking about um, the research that we've been doing during the pandemic. Hi, everyone. 
So just to kind of start from where we were, um, so research for us is often an inherently messy, messy process like it is for many other researchers. There's lots of questions we navigate as researchers. Research needs to be refined, it needs to be contextualised and, and developed, and it will often evolve in different directions across the course of a project. Beginning a research project brings about questions, the methods, the approach, the impacts, the ethics, and many others. At Poverty Alliance, for us, research is a really important and integral part of our work. And it's really important for us to understand the dynamics and the impacts of poverty, and crucially for us also about the solutions to tackle in poverty. And this is a complex task for us, particularly working in a Scotland-wide organisation. We are thinking about, you know, different populations, different levels of power, perspectives, geographies, resources, communities, practice, and many other different connections and interconnections. Researching during a pandemic adds a whole another layer of complexity to that process. March 2020 brought challenges for all researchers. This was navigating the role of research during a time where everything was changing right across the world. And we, like everyone else in this world, have had to navigate and process this new world. In today's presentation, we kind of want to share with you some of the learning and reflection from this period within the ethical principles. Given time constraints, we'll only navigate some of them, but we hope that this will be useful as a starting point for discussion. Moving on to talk about the first principle, um, principles and practice need. So it's a really important ethical principle. Research should only be carried out where there is clear evidence of need for the research. And this is a really tough question. Is it ethical to carry out research during a crisis? I think this isn't an easy answer and different organisations and research teams will consider this question in different ways. Across the UK, there was a huge amount of emergency research funding available for projects across a, right, a range of disciplines as we entered this period of the unknown. And I think this was recognising the information vacuum we faced in terms of the impacts of the global pandemic. But even in the early days, understanding information is vital in terms of service response and support and providing resource and meeting needs. Now let's skip back a little to prior to the pandemic. Evidence from GRF said before the pandemic, around a million people in Scotland were living in poverty, in precarious and insecure lives. This is a clearly unacceptable picture and a worrying one when we consider what came to light in 2020. Across our network at the Poverty Alliance, there was a clear message of a crisis within a crisis. What would this context mean for people living in poverty? March 2020 brought widespread social and economic changes. We all remember the empty supermarket shelves with the panic buying, schools and office closures, services going to emergency care. There was clear questions that needed to be posed around all of this. What did panic buying mean for those who couldn't bulk buy or obtain resources? Who was most affected? What about those in precarious work? What would happen when businesses started closing? What did COVID itself mean for health inequalities? For us at Poverty Alliance, there was a clear need to understand the dynamics of poverty and inequality and how this connected to the pandemic. For us, there was a clear need to build this information, especially as there would be different risks posed to low-income households. The Equality and Human Rights Commission discussed how the coronavirus and pandemic has affected equality and human rights. They are very clear. The economic impact of the pandemic has been unequal, entrenched in existing inequalities and widening others. For us, the question of need has not been a simple one. The impacts of the pandemic have been so widespread and impactful. And at our organisation and across our membership, we feel we have a clear job in terms of the amplification of the voices and experiences of households living in a low income during this time in order to help bring mitigation and recognition of the impacts that they're experiencing. Perhaps for us, our biggest question in need has been where to start, especially when we consider the impacts in the labour market, the groups, the impacts on living standards, what, what it's meant in terms of new people falling into poverty, as well as with clear questions about our social security and welfare system and supporting people. Next slide, please. Second principle, research should have integrity and be undertaken in an honest, open and respectful way. This principle is also a critical one. For us, being clear, open and transparent about our work is critical. At Poverty Alliance, wherever possible, we try and embed an additional principle of participation and co-production within our work. Central to our approach is creating safe spaces where people feel respected and empowered to talk about living on a low income. Prior to the pandemic, our work would almost 100% be face to face. However, COVID has changed all of that. 
So for us, it was about embedding and creating these space spaces in a different way. Firstly, acknowledging this was an unknown for all of us, researchers, participants, activists. As part of this, we've worked very, very hard to learn from other researchers and have conversations with colleagues and allies about the way we think about our work and the risks involved in it. I would like particularly to flag uh, the role of our colleagues working in the COVID Realities Consortium and Social Policy Research, and they've been really helpful in terms of I think, framing our thinking. Critical throughout our work is making sure our language is being accessible and all of our written and oral communications in terms of letting people know their rights. Flexibility of approach has also been really important, offering a choice of methods and not digital, particularly in recognition of digital exclusion issues. We wanted to start with where our participants were at. This involved using methods such as postal methods, digital diaries, online calls, the telephone calls. Choice was really critical to be able to fit in the ongoing challenges and pressures households were facing to be able to participate in a way that was effective for their individual circumstances. Also extending the time of engagement and updating and tailoring our support, we refreshed all of our resources reflecting the current context. And we'd also build in additional time to any dialogue wherever possible to allow people space to be able to adjust from engagement when, work, when often in their home space. You know, promoting, actively promoting self-care following any research engagement. And participation. Where possible, we've been looking to include opportunities for co-production, participation and work. This has been complicated to do so. We've been working with our community activist advisory group on different funding proposals, as well as working with directly on research rec recommendations, doing things like co-analysis with research participants and follow-up work around dissemination to help you know, build those connections and build that lived experience voice. As part of our work in terms of this principle of integrity, we also really recognise the time that people are given to us. And we have an approach of vouchers for research participation, as well as choice within those vouchers as part of that process. I'm now going to pass you on to Laura. So um, our, at the heart of um, all the research we do, our priority is always um, the safety of those who share their experiences. Um, so participants during the pandemic have frequently shared and recounted traumatic events and, and struggles with their mental health, for example. Um, and so our research team hold training in um, safeguarding and suicide awareness, child protection and mental health first aid. And we're all experienced in working sensitively and with many different groups of people. During the research, we planned for and followed key safeguarding procedures, including regular debriefing as a team to discuss safeguarding issues. And if it was required, we then made referrals um, onto social work, for example. Beyond that, um, we also promote reflective thinking about our own positionality and how that affects how we view and experience research. There were several new areas and challenges that we had to navigate. Um, conducting research online um, that Fiona has spoken about. Um, for example, this included making sure participants can speak freely. Um, and as Jane mentioned, if you're doing telephone interviews or, or Zoom interviews with someone in their own home, um, it's important to consider that the context in which they're in and if they're able to speak freely. Um, we made sure that we built in time um, uh, for participants to um, share issues that they were facing and to um, ask questions of us also. Um, importantly as well, we always um, ensured that we gave an outline of the types of questions and themes that we would be asking participants about at the beginning of the interviews. Sensitivity has also been key to our work, and um, so recognising that lockdown had compounded um, people's experiences of living on a low, on a low income was instrumental. And as part of this process, I would say um, we have grown closer as colleagues and um, working in this context has required us um, to be honest and open and reflective about our own experiences as well. Um, moving on to the next slide. So this is just to illustrate um, on the left here is a document um, with um, the names of organisations and advice lines that we used in um, the local authorities that we were doing the research in. So we made sure that we were able to provide a list of support organisations that were um, available national, at a national level and at a local level. Um, and as well, this is um, 
just a, a caption from teams um, between um, Beth and Fiona. Um, and this just really uh, illustrates, um, particularly um, during lockdown when, when we were doing the Get Hard Scotland research, um, that regularly there was um, safeguarding issues arising um, and it was a frequent, um, almost daily occurrence where we were having to um, discuss safeguarding issues and how, how we could deal with um, those particular issues. So I'm going to um, move on to Fiona just to wrap up with some concluding thoughts as well. Thank you. Um, just to kind of reflect back on my earlier point about needs. Um, as I said, it's a very difficult question about do you research during a pandemic? One thing that has been apparent across every research project we've conducted during this time is how much research participants have valued the opportunity to take part in the research. It's been really, really um, important to us to see that, you know, for this feedback in terms of what people have told us, um, you know, that having us listen to them at this time has been really, really critical and it's really helped people feel um, more empowered within their situation. Um, I'd like to finish with this quote. If you haven't got hope, you've got nothing. And this was a really, really powerful quote we had um, during the Get Heard project about, you know, engaging with us, you know, helped bring about some of that hope, you know, that, you know, things would get better, you know, could get better or that at least some work was being done in some of the challenges people were facing. So I think, you know, there is a lot of difficult questions, I think, that still, you know, going forward, researching in this pandemic recovery or where we're at in the pandemic will raise. But I think, you know, as long as we're pe putting people at the centre of that, I think that's really the most important thing. Thank you so much, um, both Fiona and Laura for presenting on your work. Um, I've just put up their information here. So if you wanna get in touch with them for any questions, there's a lot of great information that they gave in that presentation. So if you want to get in touch with them directly, um, I can also vouch that the Poverty Alliance has an excellent Twitter feed. Um, so I encourage you to follow them on Twitter um, for all of their updates as well. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to kick it over to Amy Calder and Neil Davidson. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks to Laura and Fiona. That was a great presentation and lots that we can all definitely relate to, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, I'm Amy Calder and I'm the Senior Policy and Research Officer at YouthLink Scotland and we're the National Agency for Youth Work. So together with Neil Davidson, um, who's the Senior Social Researcher in Employability Research and Evaluation at the Scottish Government, we're going to be discussing how we worked in partnership to develop a research ethics policy for YouthLink Scotland. Um, could I go to the next slide please, Sarah? Thank you. So firstly, I'm going to give you a little bit of background. So I was part of the subgroup for the Third Sector Research Forum to help develop the research ethics guide that Jane um, talked to you about earlier. So being part of the process um, led me to think about the lack of clear guidance and accountability um, that exists for the third sector when it comes to research ethics. As a trained researcher, I think in the past, I've taken for granted my training in research ethics. But being part of the process of helping to develop the guide um, really led me to think about my colleagues who are not trained researchers. Um, I'm the only kind of trained researcher at YouthLink. And so for my colleagues, they write, they're regularly conducting pieces of research and evaluation. Um, and as part of the national, being part of the National Agency for Youth Work, much of our work is about demonstrating the impact of youth work on young people's lives. So as such, we're conducting focus groups um, and surveys, we're commissioning independent research organisations on a regular basis. But despite the amount of research and evaluation activities that we do and we're part of, we didn't have a research ethics policy that would provide all staff with clear guidance, not only about research ethics principles um, that Jane talked to us about earlier, but also about setting our expectations as an organisation and when we're conducting and commissioning research and evaluation. So I decided that we needed a research ethics policy. Um, and for this policy, we wanted it to be jargon free, clearly outline the expectations when conducting research and evaluation, and much like the ethics guide, 
Um, it needed to provide some easy to follow guidance, but mainly prompt questions that would lead to further discussion. So the reason I wanted to go one step further than simply providing all of the staff with the guide, that's what you might be thinking, why not just give that out to all your colleagues? Well, for me, what I thought was that none of my colleagues really see themselves as researchers. So I wanted to ensure that we would develop a policy which would ensure that all members of staff would be required to use the guide and to follow the policy. And it would become integrated into our workplace culture and something that they could really take ownership of themselves. So I applied to the Scottish Government um, as part of the analytical exchange programme. I felt this would be a really good opportunity to work with a skilled researcher outside of our organisation. And um, also that working with a Scottish Government colleague would help give it a bit of gravitas when we were developing the policy. That's for you. So I'll pass over to Neil now um, and he's going to explain a little bit more about the programme and about re research ethics at the government and then how we work together to develop the policy. So thanks, Neil. Thank you, Amy. Um, very nice to be here. Normally my opening gambit would be how nice it is to get out of the office and come and speak to people outside the Scottish government. Um, I suppose to try and replicate that, maybe I should have moved into a different room, but I, I didn't set that up things. So here we are. Um, I, what's an interesting point is we actually uh, were researchers at the same time, way back in the midst of time. Um, but it's interesting to see that my course kind of took me into the Scottish Government after a few years in academia, uh, and Amy's ended up in the third sector. But we've both got that kind of base level experience of kind of social research. Um, it's just pure coincidence that we were matched with this programme. Um, but yeah, so basically a whistle stop tour of what's called the Scottish Analytical Change Programme. I'll take you to that first bullet point. Um, and this is taken from the official advertisement that we put out. And it aims to provide development opportunities for social based analysts. I'll come back to in a second, uh, as well as providing valuable support to third sector organisations and support. Second bullet point offers free support to third sector organisations. That's free support uh, in Scotland around data analysis, statistics and research in general. And the third bullet point, it does this by matching analysts working with the Scottish public sector. For sector. So to go back to that first bullet point, the thing that I want to draw out there a wee bit is that this is from our point of view, it's useful for us, whilst we're also providing service and support uh, and are exchanging our kind of knowledge. Um, it's very much seen that it's helping develop me. So it's not just about complete altruism. It's a kind of two way relationship, I think. And from that point of view, I think it's been a success as well. Um, a little more background, uh, it's basically we offer support, I think it's up to 10 days, we ended up working for about 5 or 6 days, that doesn't need to be consecutive, that's just cumulatively, so an error here, an error there, um, and that's anything between like statistical or any sort of analytical skills that could make a difference. Um, what they do is they're a matching process whereby I list the skills or anyone applying from it from the Scottish government side, they list their skills, their strengths, and also their weaknesses as well, so we're not matched with a project that we probably couldn't help as well as some of our colleagues. And um, once that's done, it then works as a kind of consultancy kind of job. You could think of it as that. Um, I did some of the legwork on some of the things. Amy kind of toned it from a different perspective. Uh, I'll come back to that in a kind of later slide as well. Um, some fast facts. I think it's been going since 2012. Uh, the scheme supported its projects with. 200 organizations of various kind of size and backgrounds and I think accumulatively the estimate is 700 days of support to voluntary sector organizations. Um, now the placements, I had a quick scan of them, most of them look like they're about uh, monitoring and evaluation processes and providing kind of information on that. There's other stuff as well about um, data and how to collect and how to analyze kind of data, stuff about increasingly so as well actually based on what I've seen is it's about visualization process and how to kind of communicate messages kind of clearly uh, and anything about kind of structuring uh, any sort of kind of significant problem about that kind of process that kind of work through. Next slide please. So I just very quickly I want to talk about uh, the ethics in the Scottish government um, and that first bullet point Anyone conducting or commission, this is taken from our internal guidance, so anyone conducting or commissioning social research, so that's whether we conduct it and also whether we commission it externally, I'll come back to that point, um, has a responsibility to consider ethical issues 
principles and potential risks arising throughout. So that's a constant process. It's very much back and forth. And that's including for any secondary data analysis as well. This isn't just about field work with any sort of participants. That second bullet point, we must put in place suitable systems and processes to ensure appropriate ethical standards are met. And that final bullet point, all social research projects uh, must be subject to an ethical risk assessment at the earliest possible stage of project development. And that is a monitoring process that goes on to it as well. Um, I want to tease out a little bit more about the internal external thing. Um, again, this is taken from our internal uh, procedures. So from a de department side, we're going to go department individual, and then we're going to go external contractors. So from the department side, um, so I work in the department uh, of employability. So each department must be able to satisfy themselves, their ministers or senior officials, the external research community, and the public that appropriate checks and balances are in place. An individual, so that would be me, someone about my kind of level. Uh, so I commission and also manage a lot of research projects as well as very occasionally doing a bit of field work. Um, so individual staff are responsible for conducting and managing social research for government, must ensure they are aware of their ethical responsibilities uh, and any local departmental protocols on how to put those into practice. The final one, uh, and this is from the contractors, so anything that we commission externally, um, they must ensure the potential ethical issues presented by a project are assessed at the outset and monitored throughout, uh, that are appropriate arrangements are made for ethical scrutiny are in place and has appropriate arrangements in place to ensure that the day-to-day -day management of these risks are kept on top of. So that just give you a kind of flavor, no more really of the fact that it's something that we take very seriously. Uh, we've got our own processes and protocols, um, which have actually coincidentally, just as uh, the third sector one that we discussed in the first presentation, we've also updated these. So a lot of it, I think, is reflected in the COVID research and then um, how we do ethical research in the pandemic. So perhaps we can have a discussion of that a bit later as well. Final slide. Next slide, please. So this was very quickly just to say that um, we worked together. I think it was five days we ended up. Uh, again, there was a few errors coming here and there. Maybe kind of strayed over slightly. Um, what I ended up doing was I kind of reviewed exi existing kind of works and kind of guidance. That's kind of a third sector, our internal principles as well, um, and the academic kind of background as well. To see that kind of consistent message across what we consider ethical research and the, the principles that were established. And the good news is that pretty much everyone's saying roughly the same kind of thing. Um, so what we saw out was a kind of hybrid output, basically, whereby um, all that data was collected. And I did that. It was an evidence literature review, will, if you will. Uh, and then we kind of worked collaboratively on the kind of that drafting stage. Um, just, so most of the kind of the, the background and the legwork was kind of completed by me. But then Amy was very much more about the kind of tone and the narrative, making sure that that was useful to the kind of third sector and very much keeping them in mind the kind of audience. Um, and the final point I want to make is that we've just been, we've had discussions over a couple of months now. The original piece of work was finished a while ago, but we're just kind of chatting basically about how to kind of make that kind of input, uh, sorry, the, the impact and make sure there's a kind of embeddedness basically from, from what we've kind of produced. So I'll hand back over to Amy, who might want to say a bit more about that. Thanks, Neil, and thanks. It was great to hear about the analytical exchange program. I definitely recommend that to anyone who's thinking of maybe applying for that next year. It's been a great program to be part of. So, yeah, just I wanted to just briefly say um, to develop the policy, we drew on, like Neil mentioned, we drew on the Third Sector Research Forum Guide. We also drew on the Social Research Association Research Ethics Guidance. Um, so the principles you can see here will all be familiar to you, and obviously Jane talked us through them before. I'm only highlighting them now just to show how we altered the language slightly, just to say we. And I'm only um, showing you that because I just want to say that we were trying to clearly outline our intent as an organisation, that the responsibilities we hold as staff members and what our expectations are when we, we as Youth Link Scotland, are conducting research and evaluation. We talk about evaluation as much as research throughout the policy because, as I mentioned before, for my colleagues um, and much of the youth work sector generally, they, may, they might not see themselves as researchers, but they would certainly identify that they're evaluating their programmes. 
So I'm hoping that this language will help them to see that it's relevant to their work. So by developing a policy for Youth Link, uh, it's also meant and it's given us the opportunity to come up with some really relevant documents um, for our colleagues as well. So we've provided in an annex things like information sheets for when conducting focus groups, um, consent forms that have been made um, specifically for Youth Link, um, and, and documents such as that, which should be really helpful. And I'm hoping by including those, it can help staff take ownership as well and see the applicability in their work. Um, we also um, provided a one page ethical questions checklist at the beginning of the document, which we hope will help demystify um, research ethics and help them see the importance of um, considering different ethical questions when conducting their research or evaluation. Um, go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I've now basically I've shared the policy with um, a small group of colleagues. They've given us some minor comments, which we're in the process of responding to. And the feedback has been entirely positive. So similar to the third sector research forum guidance, um, we've been asked, for example, to provide some case studies and which are really specific to youth work. So we're going to I'm going to be kind of writing some of those. At the moment, I'm actually conducting some research on what it's like to be a boy or young man in Scotland. So I'm using that project as an exemplar um, and I'll be writing a case study about how to integrate um, the ethical principles throughout that piece of research. But I'll also include some kind of smaller pieces of evaluation examples um, so they can see how it could be really applicable um, when evaluating um, different programmes. You know, the colleagues I've shared um, the policy with so far, and um, they can see that it's really applicable to their work. And they started to use it when they've been conducting pieces of evaluation. Um, the next stage is that we'll share it with um, Youth Link Scotland's board um, to get approval. And once we've got approval from them, it will go on our website. And then the plan is to share it with the wider youth work sector. Um, I've had lots of conversations with different youth workers who really are looking for something like this. So they're really um, pleased that we've developed it and are hoping that they'll be able to integrate it into their own work um, uh, in their own organizations. So final slide, please, Sarah. And this is just to say, thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, me and Neil are obviously happy to answer any, but please feel free to get in touch with us um, via email um, if anything comes up or you want to develop a research ethics policy yourself. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amy and Neil, for going through that. Um, one thing that is really useful is I had no idea that the Scottish government's analytical exchange program even existed. So that is just a brand new bit of information for me that is really useful. So I encourage you and your organization, if, if that's something that you're interested in, um, please get in touch. Sorry, I'm, be, I, I'm being more of an advertiser for Neil than ever, but, but um, go ahead and get in touch with him. Um, uh, we do have time for um, a couple of uh, questions um, for our speakers. Um, you can go ahead and put that in the chat, but we also, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen just so I can see everybody if anybody does raise their hand. Um, one question, um, you can put that in the chat or raise your hand. Um, one question um, that I had, and this was for um, Laura and Fiona. Um, you mentioned some really important training resources about, um, particularly regarding safety. Um, so things like mental health, first aid, suicide awareness, safeguarding, and things like that. What were some of those key sources um, that you would sort of suggest that people head to um, to find out more information or or or, um, or more info about that? Yeah. Okay, um, so in terms of suicide awareness, mm -hmm. there is a couple of different levels of courses you can get within Scotland. So there's something called Safe Talk, which is a really kind of short, informal course. Um, there's also something called Assist, um, which is a two day kind of more intensive course. Um, and that's certainly the one that I'm trained in and I would highly recommend it to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges is that some of these courses I know aren't running um, or certainly weren't the last time I looked during the pandemic so mm -hmm. there is an online I can send a link to this resource later there's another course that's kind of it's probably a bit similar to the safe talk level on suicide event 
awareness but that is an online course and stuff and that's certainly something I would recommend. Um, in terms of things like child protection, uh, the NSPCC do a range of different training courses um, including designated officer training. So that would be where you'd be trained to kind of a similar le level to, you know, a head teacher in a school and so on. So again, that's, you know, that's the training at level I hold in that area. Um, mental health first aid, again, you know, lots of courses um, up and down Scotland. I don't know what format they're taking in an online context, but those are certainly useful. Something else that we are currently going through the process of just now is looking kind of looking at, you know, being trauma informed in mm. our practice. Mm -hmm. um, and the NHS run a really interesting module around an e e-learning module around um, trauma informed practice. And that's something I would really recommend. I think what I've done of that course so far is absolutely fantastic. Fabulous. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a question coming in um, from Leah. Um, for for both uh, for both uh, sets of folks, um, talking about positionality and um, reflexivity, reflecting on your own practice. So so she she, she asked, can you walk th through um, how you do sort of reflections in sort of your day to day work, and if these reflections changed or impacted your research plans. I'm happy to start with yeah. that. That's just going um, to start. Or if you want to start first off. Or, okay. Um, I think the question about like, reflexivity and positionality during the last year has been really interesting. Um, if I could speak from my own personal experience, um, a lot of the work we've been doing the last year has been researching families, which has been quite interesting for me because I started back um, at the beginning of the pandemic from maternity leave. So this has been my first time researching as a parent myself and I found that personally a lot harder going than previously in this role. Um, I don't know if it's maybe I can relate more or understand more the pressures that families are facing um, but that's certainly something I found challenging. Also something that I hadn't really experienced before was actually researching my own local authority mm. which is also something I've had to do so that's been again I think interesting in terms of my understandings of local authority and hearing other people's understandings of local authority and so on so um, I, in terms of exercises and stuff I wouldn't say I've done anything particularly structured but what I have done is you know talked very much across my colleagues so as Laura said we are very close to the research team and I think we've I've had a lot of reflections with, with my team around what I've found challenging and also you know what they've found challenging so reflexivity and positionality we've been kind of navigating as as we go through each project and I think different things have been challenging in different days if I'm honest. Um, I think one of the things around you know you know we've been doing online work for example you know there's a much different sense of self you know when people can see we're in their home space the participants in their home space we're no longer in neutral spaces mm. you know um, and that's something that we wouldn't have traditionally been in prior to the pandemic and poverty lines you know we'd very very rarely researched in people's homes it was generally in community spaces and so on so that loss has kind of changed I think mm -hmm. people may be seeing more about what's in our lives and so on as well as you know as getting different insights into their lives so I think the questions around positionality and reflexivity are really there's so many you know in terms of how we explore that and consider that just now um Laura I don't know if you've got anything you want to add there um, not really, just that for me, I found it helpful um, when we were in the lockdown over winter and we were doing the Get Her to Scotland research, we would be having weekly meetings um, and that would be our kind of reflective space where we would be talking about the, the issues that we um, that have come up in interviews and how that has impacted on us. Um, and we probably needed that because we weren't we didn't have the, the space that we would usually have in the office where you could just kind of catch up with someone um, if you've had a difficult interview. Um, so yeah, I, I found that really useful that we, we actually had this in the diary every week and we would have that opportunity to talk about any issues that had arisen. Yeah, that's, that's, really, that's really important as well. Um, Amy or Neil? 
Yeah, no, I can really relate to everything that Fiona and Laura were saying. And actually, one of the things I didn't mention that actually sparked me to be part of the process with the third set of research forum is that I'd had, I'd been part of some research um, with uh, looking at young people during lockdown and asking them about their experiences of lockdown in a big survey. And I was part of the analysis process and I hadn't quite anticipated what an emotional toll it would take on me being part of that process. And I hadn't... Um, I hadn't had that experience before in research and I, and I suppose one of the things I reflected on is I was used to having people physically in front of me who I could do interviews and focus groups with, I could do check-ins, make sure they were okay, I'd have a debrief myself with staff members and things like that and so absorbing a lot of anxiety during what was a really and is a really traumatic time for everybody I found really difficult and so it was really well timed um, when Jane kind of suggested us working on this um, resource and this um, guide because I just felt like this was a really important thing for us to consider and you know when it comes to safety about the about the well-being of, of the um, participants but also as us as researchers so I think for me it's been a really reflective process and it's enabled me to have those conversations with my colleagues as well and talk to them a bit more openly about things and um, developing the policy has been part of that process so it's part of um, having those conversations so I think it's um I suppose I've got a lot to say on it I suppose so I'll stop there but I just found it a really yeah it's a great question and I think really important for us to consider and that's really and that's something that's really important that you mentioned in your presentation as well is discussions like this should become part of the day-to-day -day work of your organization whether you're a research where you consider yourself a researcher or an evaluator in order to embed the principles of doing research ethically, effectively, and considering all these sorts of things, it should just be part of the fabric of what the organization does, rather than just what you, Amy, researcher does as a single researcher. Um, so I think these sorts of putting in those processes, um, like Laura mentioned, I think it is really good for, for, for an organization as well. Um, did you want to add anything, uh, Neil, on that? Oh. I guess one thing I'll just jump in and say was uh, tying into that. It's not just ethics isn't just about doing what's right. It's also about what's good data um, to think about things like positionality isn't just, you know, about our role as researchers and human beings. It's also about the quality of data. And is it closer to, you know, the truth of what the data is that you're trying to collect? So. Um, just an eye on time, I'll, 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 that'll leave me on that comment. Yeah, yeah. And um, Suzanne, I did not forget your raised hand. Um, if you wanted to come in and ask your question. Um, yes, if that's okay. Um, oh. My name is Suzanne and I work for Pathfinders Neuromuscular Alliance. So we are a user-led organization. Um, so I just a quick background. I come out of my PhD and I'm now the research officer and it's the first big piece of research the Pathfinders have done and our problem was where do we get some kind of ethical review as an independent organisation and um, it was very challenging and we are going through the HRA but I was just wondering um, how important is it to get that stamp of approval? Or if we have our own ethical policy and guideline in place, is that is that okay? Uh, Amy, yeah. Oh, that's such a good question, Suzanne. We should definitely have a chat after this about that because we've had so many conversations. Um, me and Jane in particular have had lots of conversations about this. I think for me, it, I think that's what I found quite um, different being in the third sector. I was in academia for quite a while and so used to having to go through those processes. And um, at the moment, I mentioned the Boys and Young Men project that I'm working on and I've had to pay. I, want, I really wanted it to go through an ethical committee, um, but I had to pay for part of it to go through the committee. And But they wouldn't, they wouldn't consider the whole project. It's just a part of the project which I found quite frustrating because I just feel like it's so important to go for a committee. But I suppose that's why I developed the policy for YouthLink because I felt like we, that's a step in the right direction. 
And one of the things that we've talked about um, on the third set of research forum is whether it's possible to maybe um, come up with an informal space where we can come together and people who are working on pieces of research in the third sector can maybe just pitch what they're doing or just at least come with their ethical dilemmas but it's not a rubber stamp and so to me it would be really the part of the project that I put through the ethics committee for the boys and young men that was brilliant and I found that really helpful because they came up with some things that I hadn't considered and I think that's what sometimes I feel I'm missing a little bit is I want to have I want to be challenged a little bit I want people to hold me to account and that is certainly a little bit missing but I think that this guide is really helpful for you know we're never going to have all the answers we're not going to get all the answers in any place but it's about asking the questions and really thinking through the process sorry I, again I'll stop talking now because I've got so much to say on it but it's a really yeah that's another great question that's super um, and I've just got one quick question from the chat for Laura and Fiona, and this is this probably has come come up with a few organizations as well. Is any advice on gaining um, remote consent for research for vulnerable communities that that are digitally excluded? Do you want me to share to that? So, if it was um, gaining remote consent um, with participants who if you weren't doing it online we have um done stuff over the phone and we'll go through the consent form verbally um and then um, make sure that all the points are covered and ask if they've got any questions if it's anything that we've done that's been like postal methods we've in included a paper copy of, of a consent form um as part of that um Hopefully that covers um, yeah. the question. Yeah, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. Um, so what I'll do now is I'm we're going to quickly go to breakout rooms, but I want um, to to have you guys quickly see um, what those questions are going to be. And again, these are um, just sort of conversation starters. Um, there's a couple that that might some might resonate with you more than others, and I will. Um, I will be cheeky and ask uh, some of my presenters to sort of kick off the discussion uh, if that's possible to just help us um, be facilitated here. Um, so the first one is quite broad. What's your own experience of, of research ethics in your organization or does your organization have a research ethics policy? Um, do you think the sort of reflecting on whether you think the guide will be helpful for your organization or how do the issues raised in the presentations resonate with your own experience? Um, so again, these are generally just quite broad questions, um, but the aim is to just have a discussion with folks um, who have done this sort of work or who are going through the process of thinking through their research and evaluation work with sort of these sort of uh, principles in mind. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to 